Okay, well, let's uh, let's get going. So welcome everybody to uh, May Law's annual Constitution Day event. Uh, we celebrate uh, 234 years ago, the date that the Constitution was signed and presented to the public for the first time um, after kind of a private deliberative process. And uh, you know, this really kicked off a nationwide debate, a conversation that lasted for, for over a year as um, the states debated uh, whether to, to accept this document as the new nationwide charter. We always have an event here at Maine Law and Constitution Day. In fact, we're required to do so by federal law if we want to keep our federal funds, which, which of course we do. Um, it's called a lecture. But uh, as we were planning this event this year, we thought having a conversation uh, or, or debate actually made sense, kind of in the spirit of the debates that followed the, the signing of the Constitution. Uh, this year, this event is actually co-sponsored with uh, the Federal Society and the American Constitution Society. Uh, I'm the faculty advisor for both groups. Uh, that's probably rare on, uh, at most universities. But you know, there's a reason for that. And that is, you know, they're, they're two really terrific organizations. They have an amazing network of lawyers, judges, uh, law professors. Um, I hope uh, all the students in the audience consider joining uh, at least one of the two organizations. Uh, I, I think uh, students who take part in these organizations have a great experience, make great connections, and the events are always really terrific. Uh, and the two speakers we have here today are really just an example of, of the kinds of um, individuals who are part of these, these communities. I'm gonna do a very brief introduction. You're all in front of your computers. You can look up their biographies very quickly. So I don't wanna rehash it uh, for, for, for a long time. We have Professor Randall Kennedy. He's the Michael R. Klein Professor at Harvard Law School. Uh, he teaches courses on contracts, criminal law, race relations. Um, he's a graduate of uh, Princeton University and then Yale, uh, Yale Law School. He clerked in the Court of Appeals for uh, Judge Skelly Wright and then uh, for Justice Thurgood Marshall on the United States Supreme Court. And he's written extensively in the areas of criminal law, uh, race relations, affirmative action, and just a wide range of uh, well-received and, and, and known articles and, and books. And then we have uh, Carrie Severino. She's the president of the Judicial Crisis Network. She's a graduate of Harvard uh, Law School. Uh, she also clerked uh, on the Court of Appeals for uh, Judge David Sentel and then also clerked in the Supreme Court uh, for, for Justice Clarence Thomas. Uh, she's an author of a uh, recent book. I think I saw it behind you there, Ms. Severino. Uh, yes, right there on the Kavanaugh confirmation hearing and the role of the Supreme Court. She's written extensively about a wide range of judicial issues. Uh, as I was thinking about this introduction, I was trying to decide whether I should mention how often I have seen Ms. Severino on TV. I didn't want the students to think that uh, that's all I do uh, because it has been quite a bit. Um, but then I saw on the website that you appeared on TV over 100 times uh, just for the Kavanaugh confirmation process alone. So I don't think it's me. I think it's you. You're frequently in the media. So we're excited to have uh, both of you here with us today to talk about really uh, what I think are maybe the most important issues in constitutional law and maybe law generally, uh, the role of judges, the role of Supreme Court, how we select our judges, and how should judges be deciding cases once they're on the court. So Professor Kennedy, you... Uh, won or lost the coin toss, I'm not sure. Uh, so you get to go first, so I'll kick it off to you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the gracious introduction. And I'd like to thank both student groups that are sponsoring this event. Um, my comments are gonna be directed toward the um, Supreme Court of the United States about the character of the Supreme Court of the United States, our ongoing committee of constitutional interpretation and revision. My opening comment just has to do with how should we view the justices on the Supreme Court? And I'm, I'm just going to make a, a comment that in a way I, I almost feel embarrassed to make because it's, it's so simple seems to me it should be quite elementary, and that's the idea that um, the beliefs of the justices matter, the ideology of the justices matter, the methodologies of the justices matter, the politics of the justices matter, um, it, personnel matters. 
Therefore, it's important for us to know who are the political figures that are advancing the careers of people who are candidates for the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, what has been the, what have been the prior political partisan commitments of people who want to become uh, justices of the Supreme Court. Uh, it's important for us to know what's in the, the minds of the, of the judges. Now, I say that's simple. It seems to me that it's almost, you know, how could anyone disagree with that? But the fact of the matter is, um, this rather simple point is obscured in many ways, and uh, it's obscured by, among others, people who sit on the Supreme Court of the United States. So let me just give three quick examples. Um, Justice Stephen Breyer has recently published a, a book, a book based on a, a lecture that he gave at Harvard Law School a while ago. Title of the book is The Authority of the Court and the Peril of Politics. The Peril of Politics. And in this book, he suggests that it's a mistake to view the Supreme Court as a political institution. He suggests that the, that the Supreme Court is apart from and above politics. Um, Justice Clarence Thomas recently, maybe it was just yesterday, gave a speech. I haven't read the speech itself. I have read newspaper accounts of the speech, but in the newspaper accounts of the speech, Justice Thomas very much echoed the sentiments of Justice Breyer. And I think that's of some significance. So you have the senior most member of the liberal wing of the Supreme Court taking the position that the, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court justices are apart from and above politics. You have the senior member of the conservative wing of the Supreme Court, Justice Thomas saying the same thing. And periodically, we hear from the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, who echoes the same message. Chief Justice Roberts, in his confirmation hearing, said famously that you know, justices are, are not players. Uh, they are they're mere umpires. And he's repeated that over and over again. He's repeated the idea, you know, no such thing. It's improper to talk about Trump judges or Clinton judges. They're just mere judges. Now, in my view, that is all um, delusionary talk. Either it's an effort um, to, either it's just public relations an effort to shore up what Justice Breyer terms the authority of the court by misleading the public. Um, and if that's what's going on, as far as I'm concerned, that's really quite improper. Or it's truly believed and it's just, you know, a mistake. But in any event, people should understand that the Supreme Court of the United States is political. In, this, in the relevant way in which we talk, we use the term politics. Uh, sometimes the, for instance, Justice Breyer says, well, they're not, they're not political. Of course, the judges have different, different, different uh, judicial philosophies. Well, now we're just, you know, quibbling over terminology. Uh, judicial philosophy, as far as I'm concerned, is, you know, another term for um, what I'm using, um, what I'm referring to as, as politics. We should understand that the Supreme Court of the United States is political, just like the presidency is political, just like the Congress is political. Do all of these uh, lawgivers, all of these lawgivers have different characteristics. For one thing, they have different tenures. Uh, House of Representatives, two years, Senate, six years, President of the United States, four years, Supreme Court of the United States, justices, life. That probably 
uh, enables them or prompts them to pursue their politics in different registers. They have different vocabularies, they have different customs, but all of these uh, agencies are law-giving agencies, they are powerful agencies, they are agencies that shape the way we live, and we should view them as uh, lawgivers. We should view them as uh, uh, agencies that uh, reflect and that propel the politics of the people who constitute them. Implications, well, one implication is that when you read the newspaper and the newspaper refers to the political branches of government and then pushes the Supreme Court off to the side and says, well, now, of course, the Supreme Court, that's, that's, it's, it's a not a political branch of government, seems to me, mistake. Uh, they're all political branches of government. And uh, as the dean said, maybe uh, when he, in his introduction, maybe we'll get into this. Uh, when it comes to confirming, when it comes to nominating people for the Supreme Court, uh, a point of view that recognizes these uh, these 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 candidates as political figures will, I think, give us a confirmation process that is clearer. Uh, that is um, more straightforward, that is, um, uh, you know, less um, covered in, frankly, deceit than our current process. I said uh, enough uh, to get us going, so I look forward to what my, my colleague has to say. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Kennedy. It's an honor to be here. It's uh, an honor to uh, be part of this Constitution Day in particular. And it's great to see these both of these groups working together to bring this. And it's it, exciting to hear myself referred to as a colleague by Professor Kennedy, who clearly, I think, uh, has, has um, done an incredible amount of, uh, of work himself in this area. So um, first of all, I think, so there, there are a lot of things I think he and I can agree with. And I think there's also some clear points of uh, disagreement. Uh, on these issues. First of all, um, I do think uh, I, there, are, I, I think we can agree that there is, uh, that trying to pretend that politics is completely unrelated to the process doesn't make sense. And in fact, if you look at how our constitution itself um, it treats the judicial nomination process at the federal level, it clearly recognizes there's a, a, a political element to the process. We have our elected president, a uh, democratically elected political figure who is doing the nominating. We have the Senate that is doing the confirming. So these are political actors. And so it's understandable uh, that, that, that politics are going to come into the process as they have throughout our entire nation's history, of course, in terms of the nomination and confirmation of judges. Um, and I will, I will add that I also uh, do some work on state court selection. I think that's an area that has a very a different flavor to it, but maybe where uh, Professor Kennedy and I could even more agreement in terms of the role of, con uh, of uh, politics, because in, in some states, even you have an actual election for a judge. I, I do think the role is different, though. The role of a judge in an, a, a state situation it involves inherently making a certain degree of common law sometimes. And so there is a uh, an element to that that makes sense that a judge should, in, in those cases in particular, be representing the interests, the perspectives, the, the, the citizens uh, of that state for in which he or she is serving. So uh, in those cases, I'm, I'm generally in favor of state elections. And actually, I think there's some interesting work that's shown that having even partisan elections in states can be uh, can decrease uh, a lot of issues in terms of the amount of money spent elections because it actually conveys a lot of information. Just saying, okay, here's the one, here's the uh, judge that is appointed by each or that that is nominated by each party, and it, it allows the people to um, uh, have a clear understanding. I think in today's um, world, at least, while judicial ideology and partisan politics are definitely two different things. They also, the, the different ideologies and, and not, I don't think ideology is even right, the word, word, I would say judicial philosophy. And I'll thought that may be one of our differences is the idea that there is something distinct about judicial philosophy. But I think judicial philosophy um, 
the judicial philosophies advocated by the, the major parties do really differ and uh, in ways that that often but not always overlap with um, with some of those political bases. So uh, we, we agree in that sense. I agree that because the Constitution uh, entrusts this process to political actors, uh, we shouldn't shy away from having serious political debates about the nominees that are coming before the Senate for confirmation. Uh, there you know, as was a time where many, uh, if not almost all of uh, judicial nominees, uh, all the way up to the Supreme Court, really kind of floated through and got a pass as long as there weren't super egregious things about them. Um, and I think uh, some members of Congress really feel like those were the halcyon days. We need to go back to that where everyone just gets confirmed. I'm not sure that actually makes sense either. And I, you know, if you, even if you look back at what happened um, in some of those eras, there, there were people who, who uh, raised eyebrows and unfortunately wasn't even always for judicial philosophy type reasons. It was things like, oh, this is our first Jewish justice or something. And so we're going to give him a much stricter uh, review process or things like that. I think we should give everyone a, a clear review process. Um, and I think the senators have taken an oath to uphold our constitution just as the justices themselves will take, just as the president takes. And as part of that, they have a duty to do due diligence and make sure that the, the uh, men and women that they're confirming to life tenure on the on the federal bench are people who are going to be interpreting our law and our constitution uh, accurately. And I think that goes to um, some of our differences maybe. So uh, Professor Kennedy said he thinks the court, he considers the court uh, the an ongoing committee of constitutional interpretation and revision. I'm, I'm with you up until those last two words. I think absolutely our judges should be uh, in the, the ones that are tasked with having the final word on interpreting the constitution and interpreting federal law. However, revision is something that the Constitution places in an entirely separate section. This is not an Article 3, it's an Article 5, the amendment process. So there is a, there is a rule, a, a system for amending the Constitution. Our framers, as with as much debate and thought and foresight that went into the process, they also recognized they're not going to be able to get it right for the indefinite future. Uh, they couldn't foresee everything. And that's why they, they put this method in to amend the constitution. However, it not, was not intended to be done by, a, uh, by the judiciary, uh, particularly uh, when, you have, when that branch is the branch that the, in, at the federal level, again, unlike the state level, is intentionally uh, isolated from and, and sort of kind of preserved from being affected by uh, the public pressures that might play on other political actors. I think that's one of the clearest things that shows you that in terms of the minds of our, our constitution's framers, they did not view judges as, as being the same kind of politician that a president or a member of Congress is because they gave them life tenure, particularly to insulate them from uh, feeling like they should come to results because of political pressure, because of outside pressure, because of feeling like they had to make friends that, that would then help them in their future career. Uh, they shouldn't be reading uh, the, the public opinion polls. They should actually be reading the law. And uh, that, that really reflects the understanding of judges as interpreters of the Constitution, not as revisers of the Constitution. Um, that is, is why I do think there's a difference. I, I, I do think judges, um, and, and Justice Barrett pointed this out the other day, she talked about uh, how the beliefs of judges, it's very hard as a judge and as a justice to have to try to look at the law and set your personal beliefs and your personal politics aside. Um, and I think that's something that, that uh, we shouldn't just say, oh, well, judges are always going to, going to be inter incorporating this and we, we should sort of embrace that. I'm, I'm not sure, maybe Professor Kennedy can clarify later if, if he really thinks judges should lean into that. I would say we recognize that judges are human beings, that they all are going to struggle with that, but that they all ought to be struggling with it. It doesn't mean they will be perfect every time at being able to separate um, their, their political instincts in a case of what they think the right law should be from interpreting the law that's actually before them. Because of course, as the constitution lays it out, and then uh, it is the, our elected representatives, the members of Congress and the president that are the ones who are supposed to give content to those laws, not uh, not the judges. The judges should be simply interpreting the content that is put there by the uh, elected representatives. So, uh, so lawgivers, I think they are not. They should not be. However, uh, interpreters and trying to remain faithful to that the laws that are given 
to us by our elected representatives. And I think that would have, that, that really is the idea of the separation of powers that the constitution laid out and envisioned. And if the courts were doing a better job of that, uh, we probably would see our, our, a more pressure on the other branches to do their job in a better way. I think there's a lot of do, well-deserved criticism of the Congress, um, and, and maybe to a lesser extent, because the president has a lesser role in it of the, of the presidency, in terms of t the type of legislation they do. They don't fix things enough. They give, they make laws that are just so long and complicated, they're not even reading them themselves. They, uh, they try to shy away from making sometimes the tough decisions, and they like to put in kind of broad, generic language, and then all of the real nitty gritty work ends up happening at the regulatory level, which is not actually, I think, how our constitution designed it either. It's, it, you, we wanted our representatives to be making the law and not some third level uh, bureaucrat going through a, a hyper um, regulatory process. So uh, our, I think to the extent that the courts were are doing their job more uh, faithfully, then that forces Congress to maybe, hey, when there's an issue that the courts are getting wrong or that they think needs to be updated. I, I love the example of the Lily Ledbetter case that happened a few years ago, where this had to do with statutes of limitation on a sex discrimination uh, case. And the way the law was written, I thought was pretty clear. The Supreme Court thought was pretty clear. And, and, and Lily Ledbetter's claim had expired by the time she was able to, to bring it. However, um, Congress disagreed. And they said, you know, we don't want these to expire. And they went and they passed a law, the Lily Ledbetter law that changed and the, the uh, statute of limitations so that each new paycheck would trigger a new um, run of that statute of limitations and allow someone like Lily Ledbetter uh, relief in that case. That's great. That is exactly what the court should be doing. I don't, you know, it, it shouldn't matter what what any one person's opinion of the of the um, policy of whether they think uh, someone should recover in these cases or not in, in terms of the justice's opinions uh, should do it. That's something Congress gets to decide. And in that case, I think the system worked exactly as it should. Uh, finally, just I think in terms of how judicial philosophy is should be distinguished from the beliefs, ideology, and and politics of the situation is. If you have uh, a judicial philosophy, uh, from my perspective, simply the, the interpretive uh, frame that a, uh, that a justice is bringing to the Constitution or a judge to it would apply in the same way. Um, if we have, there are certain judicial philosophies uh, that actually do, I think, easily admit of the incorporation of one's own personal politics. If uh, justices like Professor Kennedy think that judges are able to uh, allow the Constitution to evolve in certain ways, to change, then actually it does become more relevant. What, all right, if, if you think you as a judge are going to be adding content to our laws or to our Constitution, then I need, I as, as a citizen or, you know, were I a senator voting on it, I would need to know, well, okay, where is that going to go then? I need to know what your positions are on a whole host of issues. If you are going to be bringing your own beliefs of what you think is the best thing for the country into this. If, however, as a judge, your philosophy is one that eschews that and that says, I'm going to really hew to what it, the, the language that is actually passed by Congress and let them be the ones to bring the actual content into the law, then the real question is simply, is that how, how can I be confident that that is your judicial philosophy and explain to me how that philosophy works? Uh, it's a very different, I think in either case, there needs to be a thorough vetting and um, and debate about, about what the person's stakes are. But I think actually the, the former type of philosophy that admits of all these other things opens the door to much more contentious uh, process simply because it means that you have to know a whole lot about the person's personal pol political beliefs. Justice Thomas in his speech, and I, I haven't seen the whole thing either. I'm not sure if they've published a, the uh, full version, but he alluded to that. He said, I think the political process around judicial nominations has gotten so contentious because judges are doing things that they're not supposed to be doing. Because um, I, I, I think uh, I, I would agree with Thomas's philosophy, which is really that judges should be limited in their approach. And I think uh, from my perspective, I think others may disagree, but I think actually that would be better for Americans across the board, because for all of us, whatever party you, uh, you belong to, that would put the real lawmaking capabilities back in the hands of the American people and their elected representatives. And it would mean that we don't have to worry about, you know, the specific, specific identity of nine unelected individuals who serve for life. Uh, we all see how tenuous trying to understand who, what the nature of the different people on the Supreme Court is, how that makeup is going to change. 
uh, can be. That's not how our system is designed. I think it should be, we, we should all uh, appreciate having our elected, elected representatives in this democratic republic doing that job. So thank you. Well, great. Thank you both uh, so much. Uh, I want to make sure we have some time for questions, but I also want to give you a few minutes just to respond to a salient point or something that stood out for you. So maybe uh, each of you can take two, three, four minutes or so to, to give a quick answer, and then I'll jump back in with questions. Professor Kennedy. Sure. Well, thank you very much for your comments. Here are just four um, things that I noted as, as you were speaking. One, the interpretation revision distinction. Um, you insist upon the distinction. I challenge it. I don't think that it seems to me, you know, if, if, if we're going to be talking about interpretation, when the Supreme Court of the United States goes in a very different direction than uh, precedent uh, indicates, what are we doing? Is that interpretation or is that revision? Was Brown versus Board of Education an interpretation of the 14th Amendment, or was it a revision of the 14th Amendment? Um, it, it seems to me that, uh, frankly, however, whichever way you call it, the Supreme Court of the United States has, the, has developed over time the power to say what the Constitution is and it does that. Now you can say it's doing that. It's a, it's a, it's an indirect form of revision, or you could say it is simply participating in interpretation. Um, again, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think one can hold with as much clarity as you were suggesting the difference. Second, on the issue of setting aside, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm simply, if, if somebody comes up to me and says, uh, I'm a justice of the Supreme Court, or I'm a judge, uh, and you can, you know, but you can rest assured that I'm going to set aside my beliefs. Sometimes judges set aside their beliefs. If it doesn't mean a whole lot to them, they'll set aside their beliefs. It's if, you know, if it's a, technical, you know, case of interpreting, you know, ERISA, sure, they can set aside their beliefs if it's a, you know, something that they're not all that deeply concerned about, it's highly technical, highly rule bound, sure. When the, you know, but, but that's not the nature of the decisions that end up on the front page of our newspapers. That's not the nature of the decisions that are predicated on an interpretation of you know what constitutes due process what constitutes the equal protection of the laws very open-ended things uh in very open-ended provisions those provisions uh, open-ended they tap into necessarily inescapably tap into the deepest wellsprings of belief that are uh, in a judge and uh, commitments, desires. And no, I'm, I'm, if, if somebody says I'm setting this aside, you know, am I going to believe them? No, I'm not going to believe them. Third point, you know, we've used law. You know, one of the things about the Supreme Court, of course, is that they deal with a wide variety of law. There's, there's, there's a law and then there's law. Constitutional law, and again, the, the things that are the most volatile, the things that really, you know, sort of energize people the most, there are not that many decisions, but those are the ones that ma matter most. The, you know, there are plenty of decisions in which there are unanimous decisions on the Supreme Court. There are plenty of decisions where, you know, Justice Sotomayor is in agreement with Justice Thomas. But those are not the, and, and, you know, that's a certain sort of law. But the law about which we are talking is a different sort. And that sort of law, the constitutional law that's the most controversial, that's really what I have my... That's, that's really the sort of law to which my uh, comments um, are addressed. Finally, 
I'm not saying that the justices, you know, just do whatever they want to do. They say whatever they want to say. They vote however they feel like voting. I'm not, no, I'm not saying that. And one of the reasons why they don't is because it would be impolitic. It would be impolitic for them to just say anything or do anything. No, these are, you know, these are, you know, intelligent political actors. They know that they are, you know, in a venue that has a certain, has such certain customary boundaries. They're working within certain histories. They have a certain sort of vocabulary at their disposal. They have certain procedures at their disposal. And so frankly, sometimes if you're a justice, sometimes the politic thing to do is either you know, be quiet. Sometimes the politic thing to do is to do something that yeah, you actually don't want to do but do it because actually down the road you want to insulate yourself from being viewed as just a spear carrier for your political tribe sometimes it's good to to go against your political tribe and to go against your own values your own beliefs because it might win you credibility probably will win you credibility for down the road, for those things about which you were most concerned. So I, I, I stay with my main theme that the justices, all of them, I'm not saying that the liberals are any different than the conservatives, all of them are political, political um, uh, figures who try to advance their idea of a good society. Um, so on a, a few of those, uh, those comments first, um, I think one of my concerns is, you know, if, if once you say the judge doesn't have to, or it, I think what you're saying is effectively impossible for a judge to set aside his or her political, uh, preferences on something. My, my main, my first question was, well, well what are the limits? Certainly you couldn't have a, a, a judge that simply brings in anything he or she thinks is a good idea. And puts that into the constitution, um, there, there, it, it's hard for me to understand what the limits are other than apparently you seem to be saying there's a political check that they somehow would might be concerned about their, the way they're viewed politically and that that is the only check on what a, uh, on what a judge would do. Um, I, I think a lot of that only, this only sort of works as long as the rest of the world does seem to be functioning on the uh, belief, which maybe you think would be naive or a false belief that the judges are in fact uh, uh, apolitical. Even your suggestion that judges might wanna go against their side to gain credibility for a later, uh, more high stakes case. It's, there's no credibility in going against your side if it's just your pipping, if, if it's effectively like rock, paper, scissors, and I'm gonna go two rocks in a row just to get him off, the, off his game and then I'm gonna go paper so he's not, not seeing it coming. I don't think anyone suggests that judges ought to vote in in those ways. The only reason one would gain credibility by by having a atypical result is if it suggested then that what they're really looking at isn't politics. What they're really looking at is the legal question. And in fact, as when I was helping uh, look at judges, uh, you know, evaluating potential uh, nominees uh, during the Trump administration, that is one thing that we would look for. Um, I, on, the, on the assumption that it, in, in one level, yes, we're all fallen human beings. It probably is actually impossible for anyone given our frailty to perfectly set aside our, our political uh, leanings or our, our personal preferences. That doesn't uh, absolve us from the need to attempt to do that. And one of the things that, that I would find very compelling in seeing someone's uh, record, if you're vetting them, uh, is finding someone who has shown a consistent interpretive uh, approach, even when it comes to results that you have reason, strong reason to believe perhaps, that are would go against what their political persuasion or political interest would be. Um, when you see a, a, a judge or a justice standing up and saying, you know, I think this is outrageous that someone would burn the, the American flag. I think that's horrible, but I think the First Amendment protects that. I think maybe First Amendment law is probably one of the areas that, that might you might see that all the time. Think of the, the uh, case about the protesters at military funerals 
uh, uh, Westboro Baptist Church, right? I don't think anyone on the Supreme Court thought, oh, this, these, these guys are great. We, we need more protesters <laughs> at funerals. That's a, that was a horrible group of people that nonetheless they said, but you have a right to say these things because our First Amendment protects that, right? So it's, it's instances like that that do gain credibility, but, but not because we think they're playing a, a giant chess game. That actually, if that's what's happening, then that we shouldn't find any credibility in that process. Then we just say, oh, you're a savvy political operator. No, they gain credibility because we assume that they really are operating on the basis of some higher ideal, some actual uh, legal conclusion that they've come to that they, they believe is, is you know, the, what the law requires above and beyond what they think is uh, maybe best for society. I, I you know, I, I think some of uh, the implications of some uh, Sixth Amendment and Fifth Amendment cases that Justice Thomas and Scalia came to in terms of the Confrontation Clause, in terms of uh, a jury, the right to a jury trial, uh, might result in people uh, being free that they and, and maybe anyone could agree are, are guilty and actually are deserving of punishment. But nonetheless, they're like, well, the Constitution really requires this very high standard of due process. And, and we need to we need to abide by that. And uh, just finally, it, the word due process is was, was reminding me, I, I think while some of these terms have been broadened uh, to almost become universal catch all, uh, in, in today's world, when they were written that way, they, they were not. And I don't think that, I don't think we can take a term like due process, which when it's, when it was uh, incorporated into the Fifth Amendment and, and in the 14th Amendment actually had real meaning um, and simply say, well, this means anything. Much like a word like consideration to a first year law student sounds like a really vague term. But once you actually learn contract law, there is real content to it. I think the same thing holds for words like due process that sound like general English words, but actually did have a term of art kind of meaning at the time. So weren't meant to be just wide open the doors to whatever judge wants to do. And with that, I will turn it back to questions or further discussion. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Uh, let me throw a quick question to each of you, and, and then I'll see what uh, questions maybe some students have. So, Professor Kenny, let me just start with you. You know, if we accept your vision that the court is largely political and the ideology plays an important role in judicial decisions, and, and to a large extent, if the court is not distinguishable from the other branches, what good is the court uh, at all? What, what purpose does it serve? You know, we, we, we start learning from kind of... Uh, kindergarten, at least when we had civics education, that one of the roles of the court is to protect minorities, protect unpopular groups against majorities, against majority oppression. If the court really is responsive to the public, if it is ideological, can the court serve that function? Um, first of all, I don't think that the court does serve that function. Um, I think we far, you know, we, we have a, a story about the Supreme Court serving as the, I think of Justice Black in uh, Chambers versus uh, Florida, you know, serving as the refuge of the, of, of the despised. And, you know, the court is going to stand there and protect everyone. It has not. Uh, there, have been a, there, have been, there have been episodes in American history where the court you know, to some extent has, has done that, but, you know, by and large not. Uh, I don't think the, the, the court's record with respect to uh, civil rights and civil liberties is, you know, not, not all that distinguished in, in, in my view at all. So I don't, I think that that view of the Supreme Court is a prettified uh, view. I think that the Supreme Court actually, how it actually operates is, is far different. On your question, though, about, well, so, you know, given my view, what's different? It's just, frankly, I just, I view it as sort of a, another way in which there is a division of power. So, you know, you have the president over here, you have the Congress. Uh, there's different, um, president, obviously, a person, highly centralized. Congress, much, you know, many more people decentralized. Then you have this, you know, nine people over here. Uh, the tenure, uh, two years, re you know, re-election, six years, re-election, life tenure. Um, 
again, the, the traditions, the, you know, the, the Senate is very proud of its tradition of debate versus the traditions of the House of Representatives. The Supreme Court of the United States has its traditions. And I think all of these are sort of offsetting. They all serve a function. Actually, I think a, a good function, a checking function. I think that's what's generally going on. But the, you know, the idea that the, that the court system is very, very special because it has special access to, special feeling for, special knowledge about this thing we call law, that's where you know, I'm very skeptical. Okay, thank you. Ms. Severino, let me ask you a question as well. Maybe I'll try to throw in, incorporate some of the student questions that are, that are coming up here as well. Um, you, you mentioned kind of a, a looking at our expertise in the state selection processes and how those are different at, at the, than the federal level one. And I guess I'd be curious about your thoughts on mirroring some of the, the processes or, or uh, you know, term limits, ideas that have been implemented uh, worldwide or, or throughout, throughout the country. You know, we have lots of commentators who have decried kind of how, how contested, how heated each nomination has, has become because one vote makes such a big kind of key difference uh, on the court. Uh, so I'd be curious about your thoughts on elections uh, for, for judges, which as you mentioned, you know, most states uh, have adopted. Most states that have entered the union um, after uh, the ratification of the constitution have gone with elections. If, whether we call it ideology or judicial philosophy, if that makes the key difference in such a large set of cases, why not have the people decide, do you like uh, originalism? Do you like living constitutionalism or any other kind of label if you put on it? And then the, the, this idea of term limits that you, you kind of know there's a cycle that every two years there'll be a new, new person coming on rather than kind of the unpredictability of when a justice might choose to retire or die. And so this could be a 40 year nomination, 45 year nomination, and there may not be another one that comes up in five, eight, 10, 15 years. So I'd be curious about your thoughts on both of those ideas, term limits and judicial elections. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, there are a lot of different ways you can choose to uh, select judges. And one of the reasons that a lot of judges were elected, especially in, in the states in the early republic is because they had been, they were very frustrated with the way that the British crown had been selecting judges and they wanted a way to have a, a more direct role in that and to insulate them from being beholden to the governor or being, being beholden to the, the, the kingmaker effectively in that case. And it, it's interesting, subsequent empirical research does show that, that it performs that role to a certain extent in, in the states that have judicial elections, uh, where there is a, a degree, if, you, if you're concerned about over influence of, uh, of, of, in most cases, it's a governor that has a heavy role, but in some, in some states, like in Virginia, it's, a, it's the state legislature, um, the election of judges does um, insulate them from that, from a level of corruption where you have just uh, the different branches effectively working together and undermining separation of powers. So that's not to say that's not a way that could be done. Obviously, in order to accomplish that, uh, you would have to have a constitutional amendment given given the way our system is set up. I think the uh, the likelihood that that would be, that would be I, I frankly, part of me just wants to see a constitutional amendment for the sake of showing the world that this is the proper way to amend the constitution. You know, give me whatever amendment and let's just put it, have, have it happen so people can be reminded that, you know, constitutional amendments are the right way to do this. I think of, for example, of the 19th amendment. Like nowadays, if, if, if you know, if some, in, through some bizarre circumstance, if we had made it to the 21st century without women having the vote, you would have had judges that just said, oh my gosh, it's got to be in there, right? This is clearly obviously right. We're going to put it in there. But no, we went through a whole process and it became a, a very significant national debate. And in the process, the, the, the benefit of this, and, and Justice Ginsburg talked about this a little bit uh, in, when she's talked about Roe uh, itself, of it, it actually, I think, was better for the country to do it that way than if the Supreme Court in the early 20th century itself had just said, oh, yeah, this has got to be in there because equal protection, et cetera, et cetera, um, because then you actually had the weight of the people behind it. And, and on top of which, the legal question, is, I think, is pretty clear that the Constitution, despite, the, uh, it, in my mind, the fact that I think it's a wonderful thing that women have the vote, right? Um, I, the Constitution didn't account for that initially, and it does now. And I think that's that uh, illustration of the process uh, done well. And I think we don't want to short circuit the ability to convince the American people rather than having them just having these things handed down to them uh, by a court. Uh, now, I think I've diverged from your question. Going back quickly to the question of term limits, um, 
I think that's again something that would be it, it would be require a constitutional amendment to do, and I think is a cert, uh, definitely a reasonable thing to uh, bring in, particularly in a world where judges serve a whole lot longer than they did at the founding era. Not just because they live longer, but because the role of the Supreme Court is more important. Early on, you had people that would just retire because they wanted to run for office, or or frankly, the job was a whole lot harder. They had to ride circuit, and it, it, it actually drove some justices almost to their death physically because it was so it was so difficult to do. Uh, so you had people retiring and dying a whole lot earlier than nowadays when you just get to sit in a cushy courthouse and have your clerks and your and your Westlaw and everyone to uh, to do this otherwise very difficult job uh, with and, and and for you. So it's it's a much better gig than it, than it used to be. Uh, so certainly I, I'd be up for seeing that. One of the things that concerns me about generally the current calls for court reform, though, is they're not they don't seem to be primarily aimed at how can we make this institution better across the board for everyone. A system where you had a where where you had that kind of amendment in order to get national buy-in from it and be able to get a constitutional amendment that way, you would have to design it so it wasn't weighted to benefit any one party versus the other. You'd have to, for example, have a start date far enough out that no one could game it out and say, oh, you know, if it starts in the next four years, I think we're going to win in the next four years. And so this president would have this advantage or that. No, you'd want to start it out far enough that you wouldn't, that we could really look at it in almost a Rawlsian, like blank slate. Let's try to figure out what the best system is. Nowadays, when you hear a lot of court reform talked about, even the idea of term limits, I hear people trying to find ways to um, shoehorn this into something that could be passed through Congress with a bare majority. That's not the way we should be reforming the court, and it particularly because that suggests that you're trying to do it in a way that is simply to the benefit of one party over the other, rather than something that's actually designed to truly reform the system as a whole. So I'm, I'm very open to the idea of let's let's look at ways if you want to reform it as a whole, but then it has to be a way that is designed to eliminate the partisan gaming of the system and really think about what's the best for the country and not something where each party is trying to see effectively gerrymander the court to make it benefit uh, their team. Well, this uh, maybe leads to a topic I want to raise because it was on the flyer and I don't want to get sued for false advertising here. Uh, and that's this idea of court packing, right? And this is kind of maybe connected to the point that, that you ended with, Ms. Severino, you know, about being in a, in a behind a Rawlsian veil of ignorance where we can discuss this kind of generally or specifically as the idea is being discussed now. But I'd want to ask both of you, I suppose, what your thoughts are on, you know, obviously we have this with, with FDR and other times in nation's history, the idea of manipulating court size, either adding seats or reducing seats to make it easier for current presidents to appoint uh, nominees uh, or make it harder for future presidents to come in and, 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 and add new members to the court. So what are your thoughts on, on this idea generally uh, and then specifically to today's circumstances? Professor Kennedy. I have no, um, I have no, um, argument in principle against so-called court packing. Um, it seems, I, I, again, you know, going with my opening gambit, it, it's, it's politics. I don't think there's anything reprehensible. I don't think there's anything bad. Uh, you have a current situation. If you think that, uh, if you think uh, that a current, the current situation the current, you know, sort of line of forces, the current personnel on the court is such that it is doing damage to the nation, that it represents a, 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 an impediment to a better way of life or a threat to a better way of life, fine, uh, pack. And I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, the, um, the, the um, personnel, the, the, the number of justices on the Supreme Court has changed over time. There have been times when, uh, you know, uh, more or, or, you know, more, more justices were, there were, there were more seats made available, sometimes less. Let's just you know, keep it like this. I mean, there have been such political questions in the past. And so to me, it's all about, well, what do I think of the political judgment being made? There is no meta principle uh, at stake for me. 
so I, I think from my perspective, it's similar to what I was saying earlier. I, I think there is no magic number. You know, there could be, there have been five, there have been 10, there have been eight or whatever. You know, we could, I, I like the idea of an odd number. It makes it easier to have a tiebreaker, but you know, there, there's no magic number and it's not in the constitution. It certainly could change. And I think much like uh, uh, Professor Kennedy was saying about the other things, the real check on whether the court will be packed is a political one. It's not, they, they, this is something that Congress really does have the authority to alter the number of justices. However, um, and, and it did so on a relatively regular basis, maybe the country's first uh, within the, before the Civil War effectively um, on several occasions um, and including, including for political reasons. Uh, however, I think it's a very good thing that we have come, we are in this 150 year period of stability because I, I, I think in the current scenario, uh, sure, you know, if there's, if there's, uh, at the end of the day, the political will for Democrats to simply turn the court into however many justices they feel will be necessary to get their, their uh, wins across the finish line, uh, that in, in upsetting that kind of ag agreement, tacit agreement, or really, I think also politically enforced agreement, because I actually don't think that's what Americans want to see. I think that is ultimately the political check on it is, does the American people want this to turn into a, the number of seats is going to be based on who has the raw power to do it. And then that also opens the door to the other party, just naturally stepping in and doing the same thing. So sure, if the Democrats were able to get those last few votes across the finish line and say, we're going to, we're going to add four more seats, there's going to be 13 justices. Well, that's lovely. And then, you know, as soon as Republicans regain control. And historically, this everyone thinks it's always, never, things are never going to change. And they always do. The other side always gets, gets control at one point or another. Then they're going to add judges. And then eventually it's going to flip back. And then the other side's going to add judges. This is, this is effectively the argument Bernie Sanders made against court packing, which he said, gosh, you're eventually going to end up with 86 judges. This is ridiculous. Um, I think that's, that's not what we want to see for our country. That's actually exactly what happened in, in Venezuela after, after Chavez took over. We'll just keep on adding judges to make sure my guys keep Keep winning. Um, I, I don't. I think that all undermines uh, how, what Americans want to see out of their court, which is ultimately the American people. I think because this is the vision given us by the Constitution, and they've been formed uh, perhaps by those ideals, don't want to see the judges acting as politicians, um, and and don't want to see this turned into even more of a political football. Uh, than it already is. And so I think ultimately that's going to be the check on the the desire to pack the court. Again, in a, in a neutral world, if we all said, hey, you know, maybe it'd be nicer to have 11 or maybe nicer to have 13 or, or five or whatever. I don't, I don't have a dog in that fight. I, but it would, it would very much concern me that if this were done, um, not only for explicitly political reasons, which is more than even FDR tried to do. FDR tried to to cover it up with, oh, these guys are getting older. They need help. They just they can't do this all by themselves. And so we need some, some people to help the older justices. Uh, so he, he even recognized that was not going to fly politically in his time, and it clearly didn't, even with that fig leaf. Um, I think in our time, Americans don't want to see that uh, that direction to the court either. Well, great. Thank you so much. Well, I see we're at one ten, uh, so we're running out of time here. Uh, I wanted to give you guys a chance to say any final final words. Uh, any other kind of parting parting comments? My final word is simply that um, I want to thank you for your uh, hospitality, and uh, I want to thank my colleague for her remarks, and I wish everyone well in this perilous moment. Yeah. yeah. I, I join you in, in your thanks. It's been, a, it's been a great debate and happy Constitution Day, everyone. Yeah, so thank you both so much uh, for being here, for our attendees for being here, and I uh, hope to see you soon.